Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4230, Abstract Algebra 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseltine. Lecture 19 is going to return to a topic that we have talked about already in Math 4230, as well as in Abstract Algebra 1, Math 4220, which is the idea of polynomial rings. Now, with both of the previous um, exposures we've had to polynomial rings, the coverage was actually very light, and it was meant just as an introduction to a new type of ring that we can create from an already well-known ring. Uh, in this exposure, we are going to be much more in depth in our coverage of rings, and in particular connected to our, uh, lec our, our unit about domains, factorization and integral domains that we've been doing already. So by the end of lecture 19, we'll actually discover under the right circumstances, a polynomial ring actually is a Euclidean domain. We will see that actually in the second half of this lecture in a different video. So in this video, what we are going to do is we're going to review the ideas of a polynomial ring and actually specify some details, I should say, um, you know, go through some details that we omitted beforehand in our lecture series here. Now, we won't go through every single detail whatsoever. Um, I would definitely recommend uh, referencing a good algebraic textbook uh, like Tom Judson's, uh, his abstract algebra book, um, Abstract Algebra Theory and Applications. Uh, that's a good book where you can find all the details of the things I'm going to skip over right now. Uh, I'm doing this, of course, for the sake of time. So what is a polynomial ring? Let's remind ourselves what that is. So first of all, to define and work with polynomials, we need to have a ring of coefficients. So the ring itself needs to be, uh, we have two operations of addition and multiplication. Uh, with respect to addition, it's gonna be an abelian group. We can add in an associative commutative manner. There's a zero element. There are additive inverses. And from that, we can infer the notion of subtraction. Uh, but we also, for our coefficients, need multiplication. We can multiply together two coefficients. That multiplication will be associative, and we will have a, uh, a multiplicative identity, which we call the unity or the one element of the ring. And there should be a distributive law. There should be the distributive laws between multiplication and, uh, and addition. Now, we are going to assume our ring is commutative, but very little, if any, of the theory that we develop about polynomial rings actually requires the coefficient ring to be commutative. Uh, but for the most part, you can assume that R is a commutative ring unless stated otherwise. So you have this ring R, and then you're going to introduce a quote-unquote symbol uh, which is not an element of the ring, okay? And this element we're going to call an indeterminate. So first of all, what do we mean by a symbol? What actually is a symbol? I will. I want you to be aware that the word a, a, the word symbol here really just means that it's a set. It's a set in the sense of ZFC set theory. Um, in this framework, every element of a set is likewise equal to a set. Um, so if we wanted to dive deep into set theory, we can even talk about the number zero is a set, right? It's really the empty set. It doesn't contain anything. Um, the number one is actually the set that just contains zero, uh, which as zero is the empty set. Uh, you have the set that contains nothing. <laughs> it doesn't literally contain nothing. It just contains the empty set. You can define the number two to be the set that contains one and zero, which that means this will be the set that contains the empty set and the set that contains the empty set like so. We can define three to be the set that contains zero, one, and two, which of course, then if we go through all the details of that, you have the empty set. You have the empty set inside of a set. You have the set that contains the empty set and the empty set itself. Uh, I think that's enough right there. And we can keep on going from there, right? Uh, my point is in the set theoretic sense, so in ZFC set theory, um, everything is a set. And so when I talk about a symbol, we're just talking about the set. Um, now, I should also mention that as the, the ZFC axioms prevent a set from being an element of itself, this is, you know, this because we don't want to run into things like Russell's paradox. Um, we, could, we could let X actually equal the set R itself. So from a set theoretic point of view, that's perfectly okay. To use R directly leads to a little bit of awkward notation. 
Um, much like the awkwardness of the set theoretic natural numbers we just listed a moment ago, uh, it's kind of this recursive manner. If you're not used to the set theory, it can be kind of a weird thing. So alternatively, um, the word symbol is used here. Intuitively, X is just a symbol that doesn't correspond algebraically with anything in the set. So we can try to go into deep, deep set theory to talk about this, but the idea that's going to be sufficient for us is that this set X is not an element of R. It's something else. It could be the set R itself. It could be whatever. Um, the idea is how do we know there's anything else outside of R? Woo you know, we, we don't have to worry about that philosophical question, uh, that, that, that axiomatic question. So X is itself going to be a something that's not an R. And we typically call it this indeterminate. What does an indeterminate mean? Well, in previous, like, non-abstract algebra, algebra classes, so I guess you call it, a, you know, a concrete algebra, you know, probably like real algebra, if you're talking like a college algebra class or something. When you work with polynomials, this symbol X is often described as a variable, right? And it's called a variable because as the name suggests, it is able to vary. Um, that is, X is just a placeholder for a number that'll be assigned to it later on because maybe X is the input variable of some function. When we work with polynomial rings, we don't take this meaning for X. X is not a variable. X is already, it's already a number. What is that number? Well, it's probably not a real number. It's probably not an integer. It's probably not a complex number. Because like I said, this symbol X is something that doesn't belong to the ring. So if your ring was like the complex number, C can't be a complex number. It's not a placeholder for a number that's going to put in there. It's just something else. And I get, I get it, I'm getting into the set theoretic rant, what's going on here. But the idea is X is just a new number that doesn't belong to the coefficient ring and therefore has no algebraic relation to the original ring. And that's why we do prefer this term indeterminate. Um, it's not, you can't determine what X is by R alone. It transcends the ring R. So with that sort of, again, set theoretic situation now behind us. We won't talk more about it in this lecture series. We can then define the set R adjoin X, uh, for which this is going to be the set of polynomials um, whose coefficients come from R. So we get things of the following form. We get a polynomial where a n, a n minus 1, a n minus 2, all the way down to a 1, a 0, these are all numbers that belong to the ring R, the so-called coefficient ring. And as such, these elements we call coefficients. Um, then there's these numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, n minus 1, n. These are all natural numbers. Um, and so we have this linear combination of various powers of this indeterminate symbol x, uh, where the coefficients in these linear combinations come from our ring here, R. And so this is the, then going to be the ring of polynomials. We might call it the ring of R polynomials if we need to emphasize what the coefficient ring is in that situation. Now, we often will borrow notation we use from college algebra or uh, calculus or things like that. We often will denote a polynomial by f of x because that's, that's how we're accustomed to from like our calculus days for which we can write this in an expanded form like we did before. Um, sometimes when it's convenient, we'll write it in this more abridged format where we use sigma notation to suggest that we have this sum um, and then an arbitrary element in that sum will be a monomial. Because after all, that's where the word polynomial comes from in the first place. Poly is to suggest several or many. So we have many nomials. Um, you know, a monomial is just one nomial. The, the, the gnome here is short for name. So the, you can think of it as the X, this indeterminate. We have many indeterminates um, as a monomial, which just has the one indeterminate, just the power of X with the coefficient. And I keep on using this word, but the numbers that show up here that come from the ring R, we call these the coefficients of the polynomial F. Again, much like with the function notation we've seen before, uh, we sometimes go back and forth between F and F of X. Um, in calculus, the, of course, is a, there's a big difference between that. When we say F, we're referring to the function. When we refer to F of X, we refer to the output of the function with the input X. Um, because we have an indeterminate element, we're not going to fixate on the difference. So really, we can use f and f of x interchangeably in this abstract algebra sense. Uh, but be, so be aware, we're going to do both of these. These numbers, a's, are the coefficients of the polynomial. Um, we should say, of course, that 
the coefficients of the polynomial determine the polynomial. Two polynomials are equal if and only if they have the same coefficients for every power of x. Um, given any polynomial, it only have all but finitely many zero coefficients. That is, there's gonna be some maximum power n such that any power of x larger than that has a zero coefficient. That largest number n with a non-zero coefficient is called the degree of the polynomial. We'll often call it deg of f, short for degree. Um, and that will work for every non-zero polynomial. If we talk about the zero polynomial, the zero polynomial would be the polynomial for which every coefficient is zero. Um, it technically doesn't have a degree uh, because we want the degree of our polynomial rings to be a norm of an integral domain for which you don't have you, you don't you don't define the norm of the zero element. But there are some situations where maybe we do want to talk about the norm of zero, and in that situation. We're going to call the, uh, the the degree of the zero polynomial negative infinity. It's not a real number, and it's smaller than every every natural number uh, whatsoever. So that this is mostly just so that formulas are a little bit more consistent. But don't worry about it too much. Uh, so in in your polynomial f, there is this one monomial, one term in there that obtains the largest power, aka the degree of the polynomial. That monomial that obtains the largest power, we refer to that as the leading term of the polynomial. Its coefficient is called the leading coefficient. Um, the the term that has x to the zero power is sometimes called the constant term. Um, if the leading coefficient is 1, we refer to this as a monic polynomial. And monic polynomials are going to be polynomials we're going to like a lot as we go into the future. So uh, be aware of this as we are considering these polynomial rings. Uh, and so again, I want to emphasize before we get off this slide here that this number x, this indeterminate element x, x has algebraically speaking, no relationships with any of the numbers um, from R. And so this, this polynomial is equal to zero if and only if each and every one of these coefficients is equal to zero. That's the only way it can be. Also, there's again, there's no algebraic oper uh, no relations here. That x to the n equals x to the m if and only if n equals m. So there's no possibility that different monomial, monomials could agree with each other. The only, the only algebraic relations that we allow on the number x are the ones that are required to be a ring. So things like associativity, distributive laws, um, and commutivity will be the only the only relations we require, and so that it becomes a ring. And we'll be we'll be very explicit about the operations of a polynomial ring in just a second. Um, I should say that we do allow it. Uh, we we actually do allow that multiplication between rings, the ring coefficients, and the indeterminate. Uh, they can commute with each other. So we do allow that, but nothing else. Again, other than those ones we require for our binary operations. So what are the operations of a polynomial ring? After all, R of X, we keep on calling it a polynomial ring. It needs to be a ring. So it needs addition, it needs multiplication. How do we do these things? So we define addition between two polynomials, F and G, which be aware that the, that the polynomial F is just gonna be the sum of monomials of the form AI times X to the I, and B will be the sum of monomials of the form bi to x times x to the i right here. Um, and we can, we, this number n, that their degrees don't have to be the same because there's only finitely many non-zero coefficients in this. What we can do is we can just tack on a bunch of zero coefficients until they match up. So without the loss of generality, we can assume these sums have the same number of terms in them. When we add together two polynomials, what we do is we end up just adding together the coefficients of the corresponding powers of x. And this is what we refer to as a formal sum of the polynomials. Although if you're in a college algebra setting, you probably would call this combined like terms. Uh, what does it mean to combine like terms? Well, it means that you add together those terms which have the same powers of x in play here. And why do we do that, right? Well, maybe we know this, maybe we don't, but when it comes to 
Um, so, so to speak, like terms, let's say that we have a times x to the m and we add that to b times x to the m. Well, because this is going to be a ring, this ring has to have the distributive laws. And you'll notice that both of these terms, because they're like terms, they have the same power of x. Well, if this is to be a ring, then I have to be able to, dis uh, to distribute. That is, I should be able to use the distributive laws, which means I can factor out the common divisor of x to the m here. And so by the distributive law, this is the same thing as a plus b times x to the m right here. So this is called a formal sum because every sum in every ring, no matter which ring you're talking about, because it's a ring, because it has the distributive law, you can combine like terms. But because x is an indeterminate that has no other algebraic relations on it other than those imposed by the ring's axioms, then nothing more can be required by addition other than combining like terms. And that's what we mean by the sum is formal. It's just combined like terms and nothing else. Um, similar vocabulary is what we're going to use to define uh, polynomial multiplication. That is, we define polynomial multiplication to be formal products. So we multiply together two polynomials, f times g. Same thing as before. f is some sum with coefficients in a. Um, b, g is the sum of coefficients from column bj, right? In this situation, I'm not necessarily going to suppose that they have the same number of terms. Their degrees could be totally different from each other. Not a big deal whatsoever. Uh, but of course, if you added a bunch of zero coefficients to the smaller one or whatever, that's not going to make any difference in this sum whatsoever either. Uh, so the product of two polynomials we define to likewise be a polynomial, where now the sum, will, our index will be k. k is going to range from zero up to n plus m, in which case we have a coefficient ck times x to the k. How do you define ck? Well, ck it's itself going to be a sum of products. You're going to take the you're going to take together all the possible products of an ai times a bj such that the indices i plus j are equal to the index k, like so. Um, this is often referred to in the literature as the convolution product um, between, uh, between like vectors, what have you. And really, the convolution product here, this, this operation here, is just exactly what the coefficient, the kth coefficient, is going to be when it comes to polynomial multiplication. Well, why is that? Well, let's remember the classic FOIL rule, right? If I have the product of two things, a plus b times c plus d, so if you have two, so to speak, binomials here, by the distributive property, you can distribute the first term onto both of the terms in the sum. So you end up with a plus b times c plus a plus b times d. But then using the distributive law again, you can distribute the c and the d, and you end up with ac plus bc plus ad plus bd. I didn't even use the commutative property here. This is just a consequence of the distributive laws. So the typical FOIL method works in any single ring you have because it's a consequence of left and right distributive laws. All right. And so as we know from, you know, college algebra and calculus and, and you know, pre previous classes, previous math studies that are probably way before abstract algebra, because of the distributive laws, we can FOIL. And we can also do sort of like an extended FOIL, right? It doesn't have to be two terms. We could have some type of like A1, A2, A3, you know, all the way down to some AN. And you can multiply that by some B1, by some B2 all the way down to some bm, and we can multiply this out also using the distributive laws. Well, what if we make this into a polynomial? We have x, x squared, x cubed, x to the n, like this one. We could have x, x squared, x to the m. That's not gonna change anything. By the distributive laws, we can multiply these things out, but when it comes to these situations, like with the FOIL method, let me erase some of these things on the screen real quick. What if we were to rewrite this using some polynomials? If we had something like x squared plus 2x plus 1, and you times that by 3x plus 5, this extended FOIL method, which is just the distributive laws, they come into play here, and you'd get things like 3x cubed, which I'm going I'm to even slow down on that one. We'd end up with x squared times 3x. Uh, then we end up with an x squared times 5. Uh, next, we're going to end up with a 2x times a 3x. Uh, then we're going to get a 2x times a 5. And then carrying it down here, you're going to get a 1 times a 3x. 
and then you're going to get a one times five. So if we have a ring, we have the distributive properties. And so multiplication of these two polynomials has to do this by the distributive law. But then when we multiply these things together, we said that coefficients commute with the x's. So you end up with three times x squared times x. You're then going to have a five x squared like so. Um, you can pass the x by the three. We're going to multiply coefficients together. Uh, we'll do that one in just a second though. Two times three, uh, we get x times x. Uh, we're going to have a two times five times x. You're going to have a one times three times x. And then finally, a one times five. So again, because the, the indeterminate commutes with the, ver uh, with the coefficients, we get this. So as these are multiplications, these are products inside of a ring, we can simplify those. But how do you deal with something like this? X squared, after all, just means X times X. You have another X right here. Because we're associative, the exponential laws are gonna apply here. And so you have to be able to simplify the product of these two monomials. You add together their powers. So you get three X cubed. Uh, we end up with a five X squared. We end up with then a six X squared. Uh, we're then gonna have a 10 X. We're going to have a 3x and we have a 5. But like we said with addition, you addition is associative. We have to be able to combine like terms. Uh, this is a formal sum. So you get 3x squared plus 11x, excuse me, 3x cubed, 11x squared plus 13x plus 5. So what we're, what we're have to trying to say here is that when you do a product of polynomials, the axioms of a ring force it to be this thing. And so unless there was an additional algebraic uh, uh, relation on the, on the number x there, I couldn't simplify it any more than that because I don't have those relations. You have to be able to combine this, and this is just the formal rule for that situation. Like if we're asking ourselves, how did you produce 11x squared? Well, to get 11x squared, you have to look for coefficients that will add up to b2. So like you can take the coefficient 1, so this is a1. You could take the coefficient here, which is b1. So you get a1 times b1. That was one possibility. You could also take a2 times that by b0. All right. a2 and b0, the sum of those indices work there. Um, there, is no, uh, there is no b2 over here. I should say it's coefficient 0. Um, so that's the only other combination you could get. a1 times b1 was equal to 2 times 3. Um, a2 times b0, that's equal to 1 times 5. So we had 6 plus 5, which is then the 11. So this formal multiplication is what it has to be by the ring axioms. Anything else we could put on it uh, would depend, it would, would require some type of algebraic relations, which we don't have. That's the thing I keep on emphasizing in this, in this video. Because there's no algebraic relations on the indeterminate x, Addition and multiplication are purely formalized. So there are a lot more details that we could provide for rings, and I'm going to leave it really, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave it as an exercise for the, for the viewer here. So some important takeaways here that if R is itself a ring, then the R adjoined X is going to be a ring itself, the polynomial ring. Um, this ring um, the ring R will be commutative if and only if Rx is commutative. Because the indeterminate element does commute with every coefficient, if there's any blockage on commutivity, it happens on the R side. So R is commutative if and only if Rx is commutative. Um, one important thing to remember about this polynomial ring is that the coefficient ring itself can naturally be viewed as a subring uh, with unity here because the constant polynomials... Uh, the constant polynomials of this ring can be identified with the coefficients elements themselves. So if a ring has a non-commutative subring, then it's not commutative. So clearly, if, if R of X is commutative, then the subring R is commutative. But likewise, if the coefficient ring is commutative, then everything will commute because coefficients and indeterminates already commute with each other. Likewise, um, the coefficient ring it's a ring with unity if and only if the polynomial ring is a ring with unity, okay? So the unity element acts like, well, clearly it's the unity for R, but it'll also act like the unity for every polynomial because of that formal product we talked about on the previous slide, multiplying that by one will be the unity for everything. And for reasons that we're not gonna go so much into this video, 
if you have a polynomial ring with a unity, it has to be the constant, it has to be a constant polynomial. And that polynomial has to, since it's, since it's just a coefficient at that moment, has to be the unity of the ring itself. Uh, one can make a degree argument, which we'll talk about degrees in the very next video of this lecture here. Um, additionally, if you think about the polynomial ring versus this right here, this, remember, is a set. This is the set of functions of the form r to the r. Um, there's a natural ring homomorphism from the polynomial ring to the function ring r to the r, which again, in a previous video, we had talked about how this is in fact a ring. And if you don't recall, the idea is you can define, because you have this function from r to r, you can define the sum of two functions, where if you add together f, f of x and g of x, in this essence, I'm now talking about the image of the function, because what does, what does the function f plus g do to the element x? It's going to map it to f of x plus g of x, which is this is the image of x under f. This is the image of x under g. So you can you can add together functions in the usual sense. You can multiply together functions in the usual calculus sense, f of x times g of x. Okay. Now, when we think of polynomials, we often think of them as functions, which we're treating them now as this purely algebraic object. The reason we can do that is because of this ring homomorphism. There's a ring homomorphism that sends a polynomial to a function, um, and it's just going to be the associated polynomial function. This is, in fact, a ring homomorphism. In particular, the composition of this ring homomorphism with the function evaluation, which is you take everything in this ring and you can evaluate it for a specific number. So f um, then is mapped over to some evaluation like f of a. Like so, this is likewise a ring homomorphism. Uh, this will be a ring homomorphism from r to the r uh, to r itself. If you compose that with the polynomial ring, then this is going to be polynomial evaluation, the so-called evaluation map. And this gives us a ring homomorphism from the ring of polynomials to the coefficient ring. Um, and this will be dependent upon some fixed element like little r inside of r like so. These are some very important, um, some very important properties with regard to uh, polynomial rings.